my name is Mark Hauser. Uh, I'm a professor at Harvard University in psychology and biology. And my main interests are in the evolution of morality. Um, this is a very interesting topic in part because um, it asks questions about origins, uh, questions, of course, that Darwin and many other people have been very interested in. And what I find exciting today is that maybe for the first time, it's possible to begin addressing this age-old question which philosophers and lawyers and theologians have long debated by bringing to bear some of the most advanced and interesting technologies available in the brain and mind sciences. Um, so for example, uh, it's long been uh, debated uh, about whether our moral sense is something that is simply a rational type of uh, issue, whether we deliberate from explicit principles to work out what's right or wrong, or whether our sense of right and wrong is really kind of like a gut feeling. It's an intuition about what's right or wrong. And in some sense, that, that distinction between intuition and rationality is not really quite the right cut because both clearly happen. When we're confronted with a novel moral situation, we often do have a, a gut feeling about whether it's right or wrong. But then through deliberation and careful reflection, we can often come up with a different way of thinking about that problem. What's exciting today is that those distinctions between intuition and rationality and the role of emotion and how we judge versus what we do, we can now begin to address those questions by asking about how the brain figures out what's right or wrong. And so one of the questions that my colleagues and I have been interested in is the extent to which we bring to bear in a moral problem different kinds of issues. To what extent do we take into account the consequences of our action? To what extent do we take into account what someone believes or intends? And this is an interesting problem for at least three reasons. One, we know from a number of studies in child development that children early on, up until the age of about eight, pay primarily attention to the consequences of action. So if they hear about someone who pushes someone down and hurts them, that's clearly very bad. But if they also hear about a situation in which someone tripped and accidentally pushed someone down, that person is equally bad because in the end, there was harm done. So for a young child, what really matters most is whether someone was hurt or not. The consequences drive their judgments about right and wrong. Soon after the age of about eight or nine years of age, the child begins to realize that it's not just about the consequences, that what someone believed and intended makes a big difference. If I accidentally hurt someone, that's very different than if I intend to hurt someone. So what they're doing is bringing together the beliefs and intentions with the consequences to form a much more subtle distinction about what's right or wrong. So that's the first, developmental. Secondly is the law. The law cares a great deal about whether you intended a harm or whether the harm came accidentally. In fact, the law makes a further distinction. If I intend to harm someone, that's clearly bad and against the law. If I accidentally harm someone, that's not so bad. But if it was a case of negligence where I should have known better and taken care, that's also very bad. So the second point is the law cares about the relationship between outcomes and intentions and beliefs. The third is that many religions make a distinction between a sin, which has to do with the consequences of one's actions and the actual doing, versus the beliefs. Some religions place much more weight on the doing part, that you actually caused a harm that was bad. Other religions take into account whether you believed you were going to do something that was bad, even if you never did anything. So we were interested in the neural basis, the brain basis of that distinction between beliefs on the one hand and outcomes on the other. And a technique has been used over the last few years in the neurosciences, which is called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS for short. This technique is basically a figure eight coil. It's a magnet that when applied to the surface of the skull, allows you to deliver very short pulses, magnetic pulses, that causes basically noise to be thrown into the nervous system and suppresses the activity in that area. In other words, it kind of puts your brain to sleep in that particular area. We now know from studies that use brain imaging, there's a particular part of your brain right about here in the temporal lobe that is very active when you think about what other people believe or intend, when you think about other people's mental states. That area of the brain in the temporal lobe 
shows a very high level of activation. So what we did was we took this coil, this TMS coil, and we apply it to the right side of the temporal lobe, this area that's involved in the activation of beliefs. And after repeatedly stimulating that area, it caused that area to go to sleep. And now when you confront people with various moral scenarios, where sometimes people believe they were going to harm someone and intended the harm, and then caused the harm, but in some cases they didn't believe they were going to harm at all, but a harm came about, these people with this part of the brain suppressed simply pay attention to the consequences. In other words, we turn people into young children. By suppressing activity in the belief area, all they pay attention to were the consequences of the action. This is a demonstration that with the neurosciences, you can selectively functionally deactivate or turn off a part of the brain and show that it plays a critical role in our sense of right and wrong, and in particular, our ability to attribute beliefs to others. This becomes very exciting because there are certain clinical disorders, like autism, which is a disorder where people suffer from an inability to attribute beliefs and intentions to others. They're mind blind in that sense. They don't have an understanding that other people actually have beliefs. This kind of work in the neuroscientists, by showing this area plays a critical role, may point the way to a new way of understanding a very serious disorder that is autism. By understanding how the brain breaks down, we may be able to impose new ways of thinking about clinical interventions that may help people with such disorders.